Hey guys, Dan here, and welcome again to that Paintball channel. For this episode, we're going to conclude our segment on barrels and accuracy, tie up some loose ends, and maybe think about a theoretical, optimal or perfect barrel that, that we might design, or someone might design. But before we get into that, I want to go back to the previous episode and just mention a word of, of kudos. You know, sifting through that mountain of information really hit home for me just how much work all the people who uh, conducted those tests put in. Just the time, the effort, the money. And it's so easy, I think, for people to read those results and just kind of skim over it and say, yeah, 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 and not really appreciate what went into that. And we ought not as a community to fail to appreciate that they have enriched and benefited us. You know, the game, the sport is made better by what they have done. And it really behooves us to take what they've given us and learn from it and try to make further advancements if we can. So, you know, if you were a participant in that, hats off to you. So, with that said, let's sort of tie up some of the loose ends from last time and lead that into the discussion of our theoretical optimal barrel. Now I know it's it's always going to be the case that you've got people who've taken sides and they really want their side to be right and you know people will always um, have that sort of controversial element when it comes to debate, disagreement, and that's fine. But it's also important to keep things in perspective. And I think it's so easy, particularly for uh, newer players, maybe they, they get a piece of information and then they run with it and they might fall off on one or the other uh, side incorrectly. So I wanna emphasize that, you know, if you're imagining, oh yeah, like, oh, the barrel, you know, if, it, if I'm overboring, man, I'm just gonna be able to hit anything and it's gonna be like lasers and it's gonna be awesome. Or if you're thinking, oh no, if, if I underbore, it's going to be terrible. I won't be able to hit anything. I could run up and bunker someone point blank and, and the ball will just sort of magically turn and miss them. It's not like that. You know, the yes, we do see differences with respect to the data between overbore, matchbore, and underbore. But those differences are not massive differences unless of course you get into like extreme underbores in which case you do see substantial drop off we're talking about small uh, variations the main thing and I cannot stress this enough when we're talking about accuracy in paintball the thing that is accurate or not accurate is the paintball itself that is the upper register that is the limit that's the thing that's accurate or not accurate and in the same way, barrels cannot, do not ever, ever, in this or any possible world, uh, imbue, give, produce, create, generate, improve accuracy. They don't. They can't. The only thing that barrels do is to have a negative effect on the innate, inherent accuracy of the paintball itself. Which is to say, barrels degrade, uh, erode, uh, lower the accuracy that's in a paintball. They are harmful, and that's it. You know, so what we can try to do is simply minimize that harmfulness. And so, yeah, it's the case that an overbore is better than a match bore is better than an underbore with respect to accuracy. But all that really means is that the tendency is for an overbore to harm the accuracy of a paintball less than match boring, which tends to harm the paintball's accuracy less than an underbore. And, you know, what this comes down to in many ways is simply friction and uh, the induction of spin. So as we're thinking about you know, the issues of barrels and, you know, all that they don't do, you know, barrels just act negatively. In an ideal world, the barrel would be completely invisible to the ball. So you're thinking about how to get rid of uh, that sort of interface between the barrel and the ball. So probably we would want to think about friction. 
Now, and it, one of the interesting tests that Punk Works did, again, thanks uh, for, for their uh, testing and uh, all the work that they put into that because they've given us very, very useful data, is that they did testing with patching. You know, just like the old-timey muskets, stick a ball in a patch, run it down the barrel, shoot it. If we could somehow magically patch every ball, accuracy, I think, as well, efficiency, consistency would would go up substantially. Um, because what you want is for that ball to just come out of the bore with no spin of any kind. You just want it to be a true knuckleball, just coming straight out of the barrel. Yeah, it's going to wander around in the air, but you do not want to have the additional element of randomized spin added to that. That All that will do is just further degrade the accuracy. So if we could think about our theoretical ideal barrel, we do have to think about friction. Now, uh, I'm going to submit that as we think about this, it might be helpful to go back to maybe some of the old days when, you know, folk were really thinking about materials as well as finishes. You know, it's very easy for moderns, particularly younger players, to say, oh yeah, you know, the stuff that happened back in the old days, that the people, everybody was dumb and it was stupid. Well, remember that everything that we have today was given to us by people who didn't have that. You know, they produced it. We ride on their achievements. And so it's always important never to denigrate or mock um, any of that. And in many cases, I find that you know, we, we do a disservice by forgetting things that were important to remember. And then we sort of rediscover them and we act like, oh, look at how clever we are. And we congratulate ourselves, ironically, for forgetting something that they handed to us. And then we rediscover it, you know, so it's kind of silly. So a little perspective there. But that issue of, of materials and finishes, I think, is worth going back to, particularly if we're thinking about the idea of trying to prevent spin. Now, I think that maybe the best way to to start this would be to maybe just forget what we know about materials or what we think is ideal for materials. I would submit, as I said, I'm not sure that the materials that we're using are the best. Anodized aluminum looks good, but maybe it's not ideal. Stainless steel, if you're talking about freak inserts or you know older barrels or something, Maybe that's not ideal. Maybe the ideal material is some sort of plastic. But what we would need to do is set up uh, a tribometer and really figure out what is going to provide the lowest coefficient of friction with respect to a paintball shell. Maybe because you do have different kinds of paintball shells, maybe there'd be a, a range of materials. But figuring out the lowest possible friction material with respect to a paintball that's going to be the place to start. And then from there, we might think about well, what would be the optimal bore finish. Now, I mentioned, I think, in a previous video that Simon Stevens had done some testing with respect to bore finishes and friction and had found that, you know, that glossy, smooth, glorious finish in the really high-end barrels that we all know and love is not actually ideal when it comes to friction. So... You know, that got me thinking and very interested, and so I set up a very crude travometer, and I did some testing, and sure enough found that, in fact, that is the case, that um, a slick finish is not ideal, that the finish that produced the lowest friction was actually a kind of ridged corduroy surface, if you think about like a vinyl record, um, you know, and skating across those ridges, that, ten, at least in, in the testing that I did, um, you know, with the, with the equipment that I had, th that tended for me to, to be the best finish. Uh, you know, another way to think about it would be is if you've seen something that's been turned on a lathe, kind of rough turned, and it's got those ridges, and you can just take your finger down, you know, down that. Paintballs just love to skate on that. At least they did in my testing. So, you know, obviously somebody would need to have 
better equipment than you know my my crude apparatus but yeah if somebody's got a real um a tribometer and they wanted to figure out what the optimal finish is starting with the optimal material that would go i think a long way to getting us somewhere again we're just talking kid in a candy store fantasy land theoretical barrel but you know it would be interesting and i think it's only when you have that that you can start talking about optimal barrel lengths you know uh, way back in the day agd did testing and they for them they figured that the 10 inch length was the optimal length simon stevens has done testing for him it's a length between you know i think seven and a half eight inches but remember he's thinking about it from a consistency perspective so what he's looking to do is to be able to have the narrowest window when it comes to range so that you can run your velocity as close to uh, field limits as possible you know he's coming at it from the angle of competition so you know in tournament play you want your velocity as high as you can get it but not going over so you know that's where he's coming at it from and there might be other considerations for other manufacturers again i don't i don't suspect that manufacturers are necessarily going to change you know as a result of these kinds of findings my guess is that if innovation comes it's probably going to come from the tinkerers out there and you know who you are so someone is going to figure out what is the optimal uh, surface material then uh, the optimal finish for that material and yeah maybe it would be something like freak type inserts where it's whatever who knows maybe it could be 3d printed i don't know you know it, it could be any number of options that might not be a bad way to do it because you do want um you know barrel to have some structural rigidity so maybe something like a deadly wind uh configuration or freak configuration where you're you're using an insert maybe a different kind of material for a different kind of shell who knows but i think that would go a long way and i think by doing that too we could really dial in on the uh, bore diameter because it really is not ideal to have an overbore even though overbore tends to to produce the best results it's not actually ideal i would say you would want to get it down to where it is close to a match bore and the reason for that is because you'd still get very good efficiency uh, but you don't want to deform the ball you know e if you're imagining an underbore even if you could magically remove the friction and there'd be no spin you're still deforming the ball so that when it exits that bore it's going to go back into its normal shape and probably that is going to induce some maybe unwanted um, changes in the flight pattern. So I really do think that with a really high quality paint, a match bore is probably going to be the best configuration. But again, this is all sort of kidney candy store kind of thinking. So, you know, uh, take that for what it's worth. Well, I uh, hope that you found this interesting i certainly have uh, very much enjoyed this part of it and again bear in mind that you know if you're running an overbore if you're, you know don't don't think too highly of yourself for that if you're running an underbore you know if you're shooting an autococker don't think too too poorly of that configuration it really is the paint that that makes the difference well i hope that's been uh helpful very much looking forward to the next episode hope you are as well come on back bring a friend